Okay, good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's having a great evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully you've had some dinner or having dinner at the moment. Tonight's program is Lessons in Tracking with Mariana Rivera um, Freeman. I am Kristen O'Hara, Director of Interpretation at Padre Rico Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, as you probably know. I will be moderator for tonight's talk. And of course, PEAK is the nonprofit that operates the Los Alamos Nature Center. Visit our website, PEEC Nature, which is at the bottom of the screen, to learn more about our programs and just about the Nature Center itself and what we're all about and what we're doing. I would also like to give a quick shout out to our wonderful members, donors, and volunteers, and of course, staff, who really make all of what we do at PEAK possible. To learn more about becoming a PEAK member or donor or volunteer, visit peaknature.org. And now for a bit about our presenter. I'm very excited about this talk. I don't know if anyone here has registered for uh, the talk we had to reschedule, but um, Mariana is an, uh, peak, formerly a PEAK staff member, a beloved staff member, and started volunteering with our organization in 2018. Um, she original, oh, that was like in between, oh wow, well, I was in between field seasons at the Valles Caldera National Preserve, studying behavioral ecology of Gunnison's prairie dogs. If you haven't seen her talk about Gunnison's prairie dogs, we have the recording on our YouTube and it is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> she really loves prairie dogs and so do we. She, hold, she holds a BS in wildlife biology from Unity College in Maine, where she found her place in field research. During her time up north, she worked with painted turtles, black bears, and small animals. She quickly fell in love with rodent societies and completed her undergraduate thesis in caching behavior in red squirrels. Maniana first came to environmental education while teaching at the Cincinnati Zoo and has been doing it for a while now. So I'm going to turn it over to Mariana and I'll monitor the chat. Please let me know if you have any questions. And yeah, I'm super excited. Go ahead, Mariana, take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Kristen. Um, and thank you everybody for coming, uh, for joining us here today and um, for coming to my talk. So yeah, so lessons in tracking wildlife. So I'm going to talk about um, all sorts of um, elements that come to, with tracking wildlife. I personally find tracking a lot of fun. I do it as a hobby. And anytime I'm out in the wild, I'm always looking for tracks or other sign that animals may be around there. It's a fun way to turn a hike or an excursion or even a camping trip into a scavenger hunt or you know a riddle or a mystery to solve um, when you're out there looking for signs of other wildlife. And it's a great way to connect, um, to connect to wildlife and the, the animals and nature around you when you're on looking for them and acknowledging that they're there, even if you can't see them, that they're always there and sharing the same space as you and moving about the same areas and um, being very purposeful wherever they go. So that's why I love trekking. So we're gonna start with the fundamentals, of course. So we're gonna talk about how to ID a footprint first, um, an animal footprint um, with a few basics. We're gonna keep it simple. So this is pretty much what you'll find, you know, something like this in a track ID book, you'll find these little track stamps that show generally the shape and form of an animal's foot. So say you're out there in the wild um, in, on a trail, wherever you may be, and you find, you know, a track that might look like this, which is a bird, or a track that may look like a cat or a dog or an amphibian. If you found an amphibian track, good for you, kudos, um, because those are not easy to find. It means you're probably on your hands and knees um, very close to the ground. But you might find a track like this and wonder what exactly it is and you want to get more specific. And so you want to cover a few basics here. So um, yeah, so you wanna start with the general shape and form of the foot. Uh, you want to look at the patterns of the parts of the foot. So you're going from the front of the foot to the back. You're going to look at the toes, the ball pad. So the, the toes, the ball pad. It's, I'm not going to like pu push my feet, foot up here for you guys to see. So I'll use my, my hand as an analogy. But um, this will be the toes, the pad, the sole, and the heel of the foot. Um, you're looking for the presence or absence of certain features like claws or webbing. And you want to measure the, length, uh, the width and length of the foot as well. 
So a popular way to to compare these, um, to, to look at more of these nuances is to compare a cat and a dog print. So here we have a bobcat and a coyote, and we'll go over those four elements um, to show you how to differentiate between one and the other. So first we'll look at the general shape and form of the foot. So a bobcat foot will register in more of a circular shape, whereas a coyote foot will register in more of an oval shape. And this is, it's especially convenient if, you know, you, the track is in the snow or in mud, so you can see this much more clearly, but cats are circular and dogs are, are oval. And you want to look at the patterns of the parts of the foot. Again, the toes, ball pad, ball pad, sole, and heel. So most relevant to what we're looking at right now are actually the lobes of the ball pad. So you, when you're looking at the lobes, this is one of the most distinguishing features between a cat and a dog. And the bobcat, as you can see, has five lobes on their pad, and it kind of makes an M shape. So that's pretty distinguishable. And the coyote has three lobes on its pad, which makes more of an A shape. So this is one of the most reliable ways to tell between a cat and a dog uh, track. Then looking at the presence or absence of certain features, in, our, in this case here, we're looking for claws. So a cat has retractable claws, including bobcats. And so you most likely will not see any register of claws in a footprint that you find of a bobcat. Whereas with a coyote, they have claws, in fact, have quite long claws. So you will most likely see a, the sign of claws in a coyote track. Sometimes you won't see it if the track just isn't clear enough, but you, that's why you, you're taking multiple clues um, together at the same time to put together a picture. And finally, measuring the width and the length of the foot. So this is a good way to really solidify what size animal that you're looking at. So take out your rulers, or we don't really hike with rulers, do we? But uh, you can have a little um, tape measure. They come in little itty bitty tape measures that might have a couple of feet or those, these little keychain um, rulers that have a few centimeters or a couple of inches on them. You can take those with you. If you don't have anything uh, to measure with, you can take a picture with a tube of chapstick or a pen or even your hand, preferably something that has, you know, a, a, a that you can measure really easily. When you get home, you can measure it and then use that in comparison with the picture you've taken. Use that to um, measure the track as well. So now we've seen the width and the length of the foot. This is also a good time to have your track ID guide with you because you know it, it might be hard to remember all of these sizes. Uh, for example, you don't need to measure to memorize the that a coyote's paw is two and a half inches long. You can if you want to, good for you, but I can't remember all of that for all the animals that we have in Northern New Mexico. So that's why I use um, a track ID, ID guide with me as well. You can use a little pocket one, or you can bring a book, or many of them come in Kindle versions as well. Um, or you can just have it at home and, and refer to it after your hike. So those are the fundamental basics that you're looking at. Again, the general shape and form of the foot, the patterns of the parts of the foot, the presence or absence of certain features, and the width and length of the foot. And with these, if you've got a clear enough footprint, you can make a, a pretty reliable ID on what animal you're looking at with just these basic fundamentals. But if you're lucky, you'll have a whole track. So we've talked about footprints and now the, the accumulation of footprints are the track that you see. And so often you won't see a full track, you'll just see a footprint here and there. But if you can see a full track, then you've got a lot more information to work with here um, in terms of identifying the animal. So we, we have here a black bear, a cottontail rabbit, and a porcupine. And I'll read here again. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, so a black bear, a cottontail rabbit, and a porcupine. And I want to focus on the black bear really quick first. You can see I have this track stamp here um, that I got from a guide as well. And you can see how well the guide has matched the actual footprints that you'll find in the wild and how well they fit over each other. And it's pretty definite, it's a pretty well-defined track and bear tracks are very unique. Um, not only are the feet really large, 
um, but it's got like this lumbering, very unique lumbering kind of shape to the track. And so it's pretty easy to identify. And up here in northern New Mexico, we only have black bears. So we don't have to compare, oh, is it a black bear or is it a brown bear? Um, you know that if you've identified a bear track, it's going to be an American black bear. So then we have the cottontail rabbit over here. Note the chapstick um, that's next to the track here. Um, I didn't have anything else to measure with, with, but that's that gives you a sense of scale about how big the track is. And again, if you superimpose a track stamp on it, uh, you can see how well it matches um, what the track ID guide is telling you to look for. So that's really cool. It's really well, there's, the track has really good register, which means it's really clear. And that tells me that this rabbit was just ambling along just um, at a normal pace. If it were blurry or frantic, um, or if it were running or frantic, it, the track would be blurry. And then you have the porcupine over here on the right. So porcupines are not not very common um, in Los Alamos, but they do occur in the VCMP. They're just not that common, but this is a porcupine track. So that's pretty cool. And porcupine tracks have sort of a, a sidewinder kind of look to them there because their feet, the porcupine feet are, um, angled, really pretty, pretty um, angled when they step. And so it kind of creates this sort of, um, yes, yeah, it's sort of this winding, winding look to it. Okay, so we want to read and measure tracks as well. So say we are looking at a track and we can kind of have an idea of what it is, but we want more information. And even if you do know already what the animal is you're looking for, you can it can be fun to take more measurements and, and record them in, in a little notebook and just for fun or just out of interest if you're curious. But we're gonna go over a few measuring, um, tool, uh, measuring methods here. And we're gonna start with stride, which is the distance from one footprint to the next print made by the same foot. So that's the stride. And you can see here on the right, I have um, a line here that I've drawn from the right front foot to the right front foot again. So the distance from one footprint to the next print made by the same foot, right front foot to right front foot. So, you know, for us, for humans, you know, you can put your right foot, you put your right foot down put the left foot and then the right foot down again. And the distance from the first step to the second step with your right foot is your stride. And for a black bear, the stride is about two to two and a half feet long. So that's basically the length of their step. And you can also measure straddle. And that's the distance from the outside of the foot to the center line. So each track has a center line, an approximate center line that you can um, figure uh, that you can draw out. And you take the outside of the foot and measure that to the inside of the line, and that's your straddle. And for a black bear, the straddle is about a foot or 1.3 feet uh, wide. Then you can look at pitch, which is the angle of the foot when it touches the ground. And pitch can be pretty interesting, um, especially with bears, because they they hit the ground at quite the angle, just like porcupines kind of do. And the pitch for a bear is anywhere between 45 or 50 degrees or even, even more than that sometimes. And then lastly, back to the basics, you wanna look at the foot size. So the length and the width of the foot. And here you take out your ruler again, you probably needed a, actually a protractor for the pitch. <laughs> so um, carry a protractor with you too. Uh, but use your ruler again for the length and width, and you can take um, any foot and refer to your guide for how, um, which foot you're looking at. Uh, the back foot of a black bear is approximately six inches long and four inches wide. So now you have a lot of information here, um, a lot of extra information, a lot of extra data um, to tell you what kind of animal you're looking at, how large the animal is, how long its step is, all those interesting details. This is especially helpful for species that, that are very similar. So for example, if you're looking at a canine track and you're trying to determine if it's a fox or a coyote, using these numbers will help you uh, to really um, narrow it down to which species you're looking at because they look alike in terms of the track and the, the footprint. But of course, fox and coyotes are a different size. The fox is smaller, 
Um, so you'll be able to take all these measurements and determine, oh yeah, this is actually a fox, not a coyote. So we also want to look at gait patterns. So as long as we're talking about feet we want and tracks, we want to look at how an animal moves its feet and legs and how it walks, which we call the gait. So there are four types of gait for mammals. And we're focusing on mammals a lot today because mammals have a high diversity of gaits, of uh, feet, of foot and leg morphology or shape, um, of ecologies. And mammals are also the more, most conspicuous animals in terms of who's leaving a, a track or other sign um, in the wild. So that's why we usually use mammals, you'll notice, in, in track ID. So as far as gait patterns, we're going to start with striders over here. And these are our felines, canines, and ungulates, our hooved animals. These are generally um, light, lighter weight, um, slimmer, rather, um, animals. And the way they move is they move their opposite front and back feet at the same time. So they're moving, say, their right front and their left back foot, and then their left front and then and their right back foot at the same time. Um, so this is actually how a human crawls. So if you watch a baby crawling, um, you'll see that this is exactly how they move. Or if you want to test it yourself, you can get down on the ground and crawl. If you really want to make yourself laugh, that's a good way to do it. And you can see that this is how we move when we're crawling. And these are called striders. And they are sometimes called perfect walkers because they walk in a straight line. This kind of gait produces a straight line. Sometimes you can see the back feet in blue here and the front feet in orange. Sometimes the animal will step with their front foot and then their back foot will land in the same spot as their front foot. And then other times it'll land right behind that front foot. So the next are our waddlers. These are our bears, raccoons, and porcupines. These are generally our more heavy-bodied animals. And they walk with the front and back feet on one side at the same time, and then the other side. So front and back feet on the right, front and back feet on the left, right, left, right, left. And it kind of causes a swaying motion, so almost like a waddle. And so that's why these guys are called waddlers. They sway left and right. Next, we have our hoppers. So these includes our rabbits and rodents, including squirrels. So these guys can sometimes be a little bit confusing when you're looking at the track because their back feet are in front of their front feet when you look at the track. So their smaller front feet, they're smaller. They land behind the back feet when these animals are hopping. So the animal hops, lands on its front foot, brings its back feet forward and lands on the back foot and then springs from that back foot into the next hop. So front foot, bring back feet forward, spring into the next hop. So the front feet are always behind the back feet when they're landing. So this creates, for rabbits, it creates a Y shape. And for rodents, squirrels and rodents, it creates more of a W shape. And then lastly, we have our bounders. So these include our weasels and otters. And they have an accordion-like, what they call an accordion-like jumping and springing motion. So they really bend their back when they're bounding. If you've ever seen a video of an otter in the snow, for example, on Nat Geo on YouTube, those really kind of charming videos of them bounding in the snow, you can see that it's they move like an accordion when they bound. And in this case, the front feet do land in front of the back feet. So it's, you know, they land front foot, back foot, front foot, back foot. And the way they land, their feet land very close together. So it kind of creates a cluster. And sometimes it's hard to define one foot from the other, but it creates a bit of a cluster in their tracks. So it's important to know how an animal moves when you're trying to figure out what you're looking at. Like what kind of animal am I looking at? Am I looking at a strider? Okay, so those are felines, canines, and ungulates. Am I looking at a waddler? Okay, those are bears, raccoons, and porcupines. Am I looking at hoppers? Am I looking at bounders? So that can help narrow down what's what kind of what kind of animal you're what type of animal you're looking at. And then you can further narrow it down to species using other clues. So we're going to, as long as we're talking about feet and the way that feet land, we wanna talk about foot and leg anatomy as well. Cause this is, this is good for putting um, foot land or footfall into context here. Now I know this is looking a little technical but there's no quiz at the end, I promise. We're just gonna um, go through a couple, three foot leg arrangements. 
um, in, and again, this is in mammals. So we're gonna start with plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade, and I'll go through these one by one. So we'll start with plantigrade, so-called because the whole foot is planted on the ground when the animal is moving. So this is how humans walk. We walk plantigrade. So we have our phalanges or the toes and the ball of our feet right there. And we have our metatarsals um, or the sole of our feet. And we have our heel and all of them make contact with the ground at the same time. And that's the plantigrade foot. It gives you a lot more surface area. It's really good for traction and grip. It's great for walking and it's also great for climbing. Next, we have the digitigrade foot, and this footprint will register just the toes and the ball of the foot, and the metatarsals or the sole of the foot and the heel of the foot are lifted off the ground. So this foot will not leave a footprint with the whole foot. It, you'll just see the digits um, it, of the, the, just the fingers and the ball of the foot or the toes and the ball of the foot. And next we have the ungulagrade foot, so this is so-called for the unguis, which is your nail. And in this one, the footprint will only register the hoof. So you have the toes, the phalanges, you have the metatarsals, and you have the heel um, way up. They're raised off. You won't see them on the ground. And you're just standing on the hoof or the nail. So that's just the very tip of the toe where the nail is. That's what these animals are standing on. So the plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade um, foot and leg arrangements, you'll find these in mammals. And most mammals are actually plantigrade. Um, but as you, the, so the plantigrade has the advantage of that traction and grip that I spoke about. So that's a big advantage um, for, these, for these animals. And they also can walk uh, far distances this way at an easy pace. As you depart from plantigrade, you actually get a benefit in speed. So our fastest land mammals or our fastest land animals are um, digitigrade and ungulagrade. So they're the cheetah and the pronghorn and they're very fast. And this kind of foot arrangement gives more spring to the step and more leverage. And that creates a really fast um, high speeds. So I have three examples here. Um, of local wildlife that fit these three arrangements here. We have a red squirrel that's plantigrade. We have a coyote that's digitigrade and a, a mule deer that's ungulligrade. I'll just leave that up for a moment while I take a drink of water. Okay. So I am not a bird expert. I specialize in mammals, but I would rem be remiss not to mention birds at least briefly. So birds are also digitigrade. And this kind of uh, foot morphology, this foot shape is ideal for perching. And it's also ideal for running for ground birds. Um, and so the footprint, like all digitigrade animals, would just register the toes of the foot and the ball of the foot. And of course, the bones are a little bit different um, in a bird than they are in a mammal. They have a tarsal metatarsus instead of metatarsals, but um, the arrangement is the same. So here's um, a spotted toe. He has an example. You can see the splayed toes that are that are making contact with the ground and the rest of the foot is raised um, until you get to the heel or ankle there where it bends. So, and you can see the gait on the left here. That's the gait of a tohi and they are hoppers. Um, and except, of course, they only have two feet instead of four, so it's a little um, easier to tell exactly what movement is going on here, um, but they are also hoppers. There's a wide variety of variation in the tracks that birds leave. You can see at the top these dactyls here. These are different variations in how the feet or how the toes are laid out. So tohis are anisodactyl, and that basically just means that they have three toes in front and one toe in back. And that's really ideal for perching and grabbing onto branches and other things like that. Um, so that's just one example um, of many variations that you'll see in bird feet, but they are all um, digitigrade. And of course, in some, some tracks, you will be able to see talons and in other tracks, you won't be able to see them um, depending on the species. So along that vein, we'll talk more about the bottom of an animal's foot. 
So I have the three again, plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade here. And I'm going to use the squirrel, the bobcat, and the deer as examples. So we'll start with the squirrel here. And you can see how the bottom of the foot matches the track stamp really well. I love the feet. I love plantigrade feet. I love feet on rodents. I just can't get enough of looking at them. But um, you can see how well it matches the track stamp. And you, you might note that the hind foot is more clear that this is a plantigrade animal on the hind foot than it is on the front foot. And that's because these are hopping animals, as I mentioned, uh, or the, the rodents at least are hopping animals. And it benefits them to have larger hind feet than front feet. And so the hind foot touches the ground a little bit more. And so you can really see the toes the ball, the sole, and the heel on this plantigrade foot. And you can really see it very well on that squirrel foot you see there. Now in digitigrade animals, it would not be beneficial to have different sized feet. That would make them very clumsy. It would not be conducive to running at all. So their front and hind feet look alike because they're basically the same size. And you see here that only the toe and the ball of the foot, like we've discussed before, are touching the ground. And you can see that on, in this bobcat photo here, uh, you've got the toes and the ball of the foot. That's what, what we might call the paw pad, what people will call the paw pad. Um, and you might mistake that for the sole. Okay, everybody, let's try this again. Okay, thank you everybody for bearing with me and hopefully my screen will not go black again. Um, so I can just continue the talk uninterrupted, um, but thank you so much uh, for bearing with me. So I'll just continue where, where we left off. Um, I spoke about the squirrel foot and the bobcat foot, um, and that you can see in the bobcat foot um, that we have the toes as well as the ball pad registered there. So this is the digitigrade animal. And so moving on to the ungulagrade animal, we have a deer here, and as you can see, the only the nail at the very tip of the toe is making contact with the ground. And with the deer, it kind of creates this upside down heart shaped uh, track. So what kind of animals, what are native animals um, in our region that share these characteristics? So we'll go over our plantigrade animals first. And these include our bear, skunk and raccoon, our rabbit, our rodents, which are my favorite, of course, um, our bats and departing from mammals, we have reptiles and amphibians that are plantigrade as well. So that's a good amount of animal. In terms of mammals, um, most mammals in the world are plantigrade as most mammals are rodents and bats. So for our digitigrade animals um, in the region, we have our canids, the coyote, fox, and domestic dog. We have our felids, the bobcat, mountain lion, and house cat. We have our weasels and of course our birds as well. And for our ungulates, we have our cervids, our mule deer and elk, our bovids, bighorn sheep and cattle, and our equids, horse and burro um, farther south. And I wanted to mention also that our, the equids are odd toed. So ungulates come in even toed and odd toed. So the deer is an even toed ungulate, and the, uh, the, the horse is an odd toed ungulate. So that's why you only see that typical horseshoe shape, just the one. Uh, nail um, touching the ground with with horses. So we I want to move past the or we're not really moving past it. We're still talking about the feet, um, but we're going to talk about ecology and morphology. Um, so I spoke about the the local wildlife that you'll see is plantigrade, digitigrade, and wildlife and um, ungulagrade. Actually, I'll go back really quick. You'll notice that our digitigrade animals here, all of our mammals are uh, predators, um, in fact, and all of our ungulagrade animals are prey animals. So we'll talk a little bit about why this is um, with ecology and morphology. So an animal's ecology is its relationship with its environment and its morphology is its shape and form. So you can see here, there's an abert squirrel or tassel-eared squirrel, and they are tree squirrels and they have plantigrade feet. So you can kind of see the feet really planted um, flat on that branch and they are heavy bodied animals, which we'll talk about in a moment. And so that's how their ecology and morphology are related. So we're gonna take three local species, the black bear, 
the coyote and the deer, again, a plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulate animals. And we're going to talk a bit about their ecology and morphology here. So we'll start with the black bear. Black bears evolved to cover long distances at a walking pace. So they're walkers. Um, we call them walkers or ambulatory. So an ambulatory animal walks as its main mode of transportation. And bears are mostly foragers and scavengers. They also hunt, of course, they're omnivores. So they eat both meat and plant material. But for the most part, they prefer to forage and scavenge. Most of a bear, black bear's diet consists of plant material. So this means that they can, because they're not usually hunt, chasing and hunting other animals, they can take their time in the woods. They just amble about. They're walking at an easy pace, following their nose, covering long distances. And so, um, as I said, they're ambulatory. These animals are heavy bodied. Black bears are heavy bodied, as you can see. Most plantigrade mammals are heavy bodied. Um, and they have this kind of stocky look to them, heavy bodied with shorter stocky legs. And that's because they didn't evolve to have to chase or run away from other animals uh, for the most part. Um, so they, they can be heavy bodied. And despite that, despite being quite heavy, black bears are adept climbers, as you probably know, they climb very well up and down trees. And a lot of that is of course attributed to their plantigrade foot. So they have a lot of surface area in that foot. So it gives them a lot of traction and grip. And so they're able to climb really well that way. And they're also very muscled animals. So plantigrade animals have a lot of muscle. They're, as you can see, heavy and muscular. Um, even, the, even the little guys, the, the squirrels and the prairie dogs, they're very muscular and very strong animals. So that also makes them adept climbers as well. Moving on to our digitigrade local species, the, the coyote, um, these guys evolved to run. So these are runners and their feet and the rest of their body are evolved for running. And we call the runners cursorial. So these are cursorial predators, the coyotes. They do hunt more than black bears do. Coyotes love to hunt. Um, they are also omnivores um, eating plant and meat material. So they do forage and scavenge as well. Um, but they prefer to hunt um, prey animals. So because they're runners and they spend most of their time running at moderate to fast speeds and cover long distances, it's important that they be slim bodied. That way they can carry their weight, which is not a lot of weight, they can carry their weight longer distances and at faster speeds. And it also gives them high stamina. So these are uh, high endurance, high stamina animals and they can move very long distances. And one interesting thing about their digitigrade foot is that it has less contact with the ground, so they make less noise when they run. You'll definitely hear a black bear if it's running after you, uh, but you're less likely to, likely to hear a coyote. And that's more than about size. It's also about the way their foot touches the ground. So here we have the mule deer is going to be our Angola grade species. And mule deer are also cursorial. So that might seem a little bit counterintuitive because when you see a mule deer up here, they're almost always just ambling about, completely oblivious to us, just walking as slow as possible. But um, they're actually adapted and they've evolved for running. And so we do consider them runners and we call them cursorial prey species. And of course, they adapted for running because they need to escape predators. They are prey animals. And they have these long, thin legs, these skinny legs, um, and that makes their leg easier to move. So the less mass you have in your leg, the easier it is to move. And coupled with a really muscled thigh, it's ideal for sudden bursts of speed. So they, you've probably seen them with just suddenly taking off if they're frightened or startled. Um, and that's how their that's how their morphology works to their benefit and these are also high stamina animals it's a bit of an evolutionary arms race right so if they're running away from high stamina animals they have to have high stamina as well and the same for speed they're fast animals a, a fast prey animal has to escape a fast predator and a fast predator has to catch a fast prey animal so um, it's a bit of an arms race for them so as long as we're talking about ecology, um, we're gonna move on to other signs because I've talked about uh, 
identifying footprints and identifying tracks, but there are also other signs that animals will leave in the wild. And um, some sign includes something like a bear leaving its claw marks in a tree, for example. Um, and you might not even see any, any footprints or tracks around, but you'll know that a bear was there um, based on this sign. So we're going to start with scat or poop, everybody's favorite topic when it comes to wildlife, at least the kids love it. Um, so we're gonna talk about the structure and material of scat um, and what you might find there. Um, you guys are probably used to um, some rabbit and, and deer scat. And so you already know a little bit about what you're looking for, but when we're talking about shape, length and width and texture, we can see, um, so you see this picture here that was from a rodent. Rodents and most of our herbivores, not all, but most of our herbivores leave pellets. They, their scat comes out in pellets. Some of them are spherical and some of them are elongated, um, but you'll see these pellets um, and they just come out kind of in a, in a pile of, of BBs. Um, so, and I'm sorry, and our omnivores and carnivores leave cords. So much like your domestic dog at, or cat at home, they leave cords of poop and um, all sorts of interesting and disgusting material we're covering here. Um, so in terms of what is in the scat, you're looking at plant matter, animal matter, or no distinguishable matter. So herbivores have very complex digestive systems, complex stomachs and digestive systems. So the food that they are processing, it, it gets more processed. Um, so it goes through processing more. And so that's why often or more likely their scat comes out pretty homogenous when, in, when it comes to material and matter, you won't really see anything in them. Sometimes every once in a while you might see some seeds or leaf here and there, uh, but for the most part, it's homogenous because the food gets so processed. Um, in contrast, our omnivores and carnivores, they have simpler stomachs, simpler digestive systems. So their food doesn't get processed as much. And so they, their food comes out with pretty um, visible plant and animal matter for the most part. So we're going to see some examples of what I'm talking about. So we've got a deer, a rabbit, a black bear, a coyote, a dog, and a bird. So you can see um, the deer and the rabbit are herbivores who poop pellets. Um, they're pretty homogenous looking. Uh, as a note, this is part of why scale is important and why measuring scale is, is important when you're taking pictures of sign because it's kind of hard to tell that that is rabbit. You don't know if that's rabbit or deer because there's no scale, but um, it is rabbit scat. You have black bears. Black bears do poop in cords, but they really falls in big piles. Um, like those dinner plate size piles uh, that are described. And you will always find some material in black bear scat. And usually it'll be plant material, it'll be seeds, um, acorns, leaves, all sorts of plant material. And it often doesn't even look like it's really been well digested. It's just not processed very well in the, the black bear stomach. So on the lower left, you see a coyote, and you'll see in the yellow circle, there's actually a rodent skull in there. And you will often find animal material in coyote scat. You'll find fur and bones. You'll also find a lot of plant material because they are omnivores. You'll find berries and other seeds and, and, and plants um, in coyote scat. And you can contrast that with dog poop um, with the domestic dog. Most domestic dogs eat a highly processed diet. So you're, you know, if they've got their kibble, um, and other highly processed foods with treats and such. And so you usually just see this homogenous material with dog scat. Um, uh, and that's a big contrast with the coyote. And of course you have bird, which is pretty recognizable what birds leave behind. So as fun as it is to talk about poop all day, um, we'll talk about other sign as well. So starting with torn brows up here on the upper left, you can see that this twig has been torn. Um, part of it has been torn. Maybe there was a bud at the end of it. And this is typical of deer. So deer, um, their insides, so we have incisors, top and bottom incisors as human beings and most animals, most mammals do. But deer, they only have their bottom incisors. So the front teeth, we use our front teeth, our incisors to 
um, slice things and to chip things off and to bite things. But the deer only has lower incisors, so they can bite, but not really chip things off. They can bite and tear. And that's why you see a lot of horn brows when deer have been around and feeding in the area. Some other sign might include some forage leavings, like these pine cone scales on the upper right. So this is indicative of a squirrel, um, and you've probably seen these out in the wild. Squirrels will, will make a huge mess. They like to eat kind of in one spot. They like to come back to this same spot to eat, which is why there are so many leftovers um, that they leave behind. You also have on the lower left, you have beds. Um, this is a deer bed and it was made in the snow. So it's more obvious in the snow where the dirt has been a little kicked up and where the body heat from the deer has melted the snow. And then on the lower right, you have dens. You can look for dens, um, all sorts of animals that live in dens, porcupines, uh, bear, prairie dogs, um, ground squirrels. Um, this particular den belonged to a porcupine um, and you can see how filthy it is. Um, sometimes, not always, certain, some porcupines will walk all over their poop when they go in and out of a den. So sometimes they can get kind of filthy. And um, so if you want to know what kind of den it belongs to, you can also look around and see um, if there are any tracks around, which there were here. Um, I actually stuck my head in this den, which I do not recommend doing. Just do not do something like that at all. I was startled to find two porcupines in there. They knew I was coming, so um, I wasn't met with any uh, <laughs> any unfortunate situation, gladly. Um, but the poor things were making these little sounds. That's what they sounded like, and I felt really bad. So never stick your head in an animal den. First of all, it's harassing wildlife, and second of all, you could get really hurt. Um, but there are other ways to investigate and find out who lives in that den. So the most fun part about tracking is interpretation and telling a story. So in the interest of time, I'll just go over a couple of these and I'll go, um, I'll start with this one. Um, to, so to tell a story, you go from setting to characters to plot and you can kind of put together any clues to, to tell a story. And here we have our setting, a nice plank of wood, um, it looks like it's probably a nice overcast day. We have some twigs and some pine cones laying around, and we have a bunch of pine scales just sitting in a pile and all over the place. And so our characters, of course, you can probably guess that we're starting with a squirrel. Um, as you saw in that previous picture, squirrels leave these big messes. What they're doing is they're pulling the scale off the pine cone and there's a seed in that scale and they're eating the seed off the scale and then just dropping the scale because it's just a waste they don't eat the scale um, so that's why they leave such a big mess and of course you have evidence of a bird here um, I think there were maybe there were two birds I can just take some license and say there were two birds um, or you can consider it one that was hopping around um, but those are that's our cast of characters and then you can come up with, you know, the plot of what was going on here. And I I wrote a story, in fact, for this, and um, I will read it. It's quite, um, well, gather around, I'll read it for you. So once upon a recent time ago, on an overcast day, a squirrel found herself in want of food. She found a fresh pine cone in a pile she kept, parked herself in a nice, comfortable spot, and took her leisurely time enjoying her breakfast. Knowing it would take her three to five minutes to finish her cone, she chose a spot and time free of predators and other squirrels who might harass her while she ate her meal. She was quite happy. Up, up above Mrs. Squirrel, two birds waited and watched as she ate. They were patient birds and had some time to kill. After Mrs. Squirrel finished her meal, Mr. and Mr. Bird swooped down to see if she'd left any seeds behind. They were quite crafty, Mr. and Mr. Bird, but also poopy. What better way to leave a mark of your presence after all other than poop? They stood for a little while, pecked through the pine cones, and finally satisfied went on their way, likely back up to the branches to watch for Mrs. Squirrel again. It was, after all, a nice idyllic fairy tale afternoon in the woods, with a fat happy squirrel and two clever birds, the kind of scene you'd want to video and put up on YouTube with relaxing ambient music. Or you could just say, a squirrel and a couple of birds were here, the squirrel ate, the birds checked what was left behind, and they all moved on. And both interpretations are equally valid. It just depends on whether you prefer to take a creative look at it or a more anal analytical look at it. You can create a fictional story, but it's not 
fictional facts that you're using. You're using actual clues and you can create any story you want, whether it's um, a little story about Mr. and Mrs. Squirrel and Bird or just analyzing and interpreting what you're seeing in a much more simpler way. I prefer to tell the creative stories when I have kids around me, for example. So when I'm out there with kids, it kind of makes it more memorable. Um, but either way, you do you. So there's a, another scene here um, that I'd like to, like to look at with um, a pond, actually. So this is a wintry scene here that we have, and there are several tracks. There's a pond up above the picture. You, It's not in the picture, but it's up there. And we have several characters here. Uh, we have two deer, a porcupine, and a squirrel. So you can see the deer, the two deer tracks. You can see kind of the pinpoint um, stride of the deer. So these are striders, that straight stride that they have. You have the porcupine that's kind of, as I've shown before, kind of a little bit wobbly of a track. These are waddlers, like we've spoken about. And then you have the squirrel on the right, the hoppers. You can see the telltale sort of W shape to the squirrel hopping and hitting the ground. So what, what happened here is what you're seeing here um, is, and I'll interpret it in a more analytical way, what you're seeing is uh, the what's de being demonstrated is the ecological, um, excuse me, the... Um, <laughs> What you're seeing is the ecology of the way sources of water bring wildlife to them. So you'll see a higher diversity and higher occurrence of wildlife at bodies of water. And there is a pond here. So you'll see all sorts of tracks. If you're looking for tracking to do some tracking, you're looking for tracks, whether it's in the snow or the mud or whenever it is, or looking for other sign, I highly suggest going to a body of water, whether it's a pond or a river, and you'll definitely find sign there, a lot more variation in species as well. So the deer probably, they might've come together or separately. They came during the day and they drank at the pond. It's It just recently snowed. The pond wasn't frozen yet, but it was going to be frozen soon. So the deer took the opportunity to drink. The squirrel is also diurnal, active during the day. So came up to drink. This squirrel, um, the pond is probably in the squirrel's territory. And so the squirrel was able to just go up and have a drink, all nice and relaxed. Porcupines are nocturnal, so they're active during the night. So the porcupine probably did not interact with these other animals, um, came in during the night and had a drink and then um, went about its way. So the last scene here um, is fraught with suspense, this one. So we're in the snow again, which is obviously the perfect setting for tracks. And we have two different animals here. In red, we have a mouse. And in purple, we have a fox. So I know this is a mouse. The way I determined it was, um, was it has that typical W shape of the track of a hopping animal, of a hopping rodent specifically. And there's also a tail. You can see the mark of a tail here um, in the track. And the size of, of the track um, also told me that this is a mouse. So there's no scale here, but it was it's very small. Um, told me that it's a mouse. And then you also have this fox up here. This is a canine uh, footprint. It's a little bit hard to tell, but you have four toes and the lobe of the foot, uh, or I'm sorry, the pad of the foot has three lobes. And that three lobed pad is characteristic of a canine footprint. Um, and so you have a mouse and a fox. It's quite a small footprint um, for the fox. So you know it's not a coyote. It's very tiny. Um, the fox print uh, was probably a, a gray fox. But you have a bit of story here. The mouse is heading in two directions. It's possible that it was two mice, but I believe it was one mouse that went one direction and turned around and went the other. And you have the fox following the mouse going left to right, following the mouse's trail. I don't believe that these two interacted at all. The mouse is bound, or it's not bounding, it's hopping at a reasonable pace. You can see because if the mouse was fleeing or running away, you wouldn't see its tail because mice will lift their tail when they're running. But you see the tail here, so it tells you 
okay, the mouse was not running away from anything. It was just exploring or going from one point to another, maybe looking for some food. And the fox is also not running. It's not chasing anything. It's just on the hunt, following the scent and the sight of the mouse. So I did really quick write a story for this one, at least that I can read to you guys really quick. So once upon another time in winter, Mr. Mouse was enjoying a calm, brisk night in the field, looking for something to eat, going this way and that, not even aware that danger was stalking nearby. He returned home to his cozy den to sleep in the warmth of his grassy bedding. It was near dawn, and he was ready to sleep off an uneventful night. Shortly thereafter, the nearby Mrs. Fox caught the scent and sight of Mr. Mouse's tracks and slowly but surely followed the trail. She was hungry, and finding meat was of the essence for Fox in the dead of night, in the dead of winter. Now it's not for me to say, but maybe Mrs. Fox found Mr. Mouse obliviously resting in his den, or maybe she moved on without her snack, leaving Mr. Mouse to live another night and likely be caught by another predator as goes the circle of life. Or you could just say, a mouse went out and back exploring or searching for food, a nearby fox followed its trail to its den, and the mouse may or may not have gotten eaten. So you can interpret it either way. No matter how you're telling the story, you're putting it together, you're putting the story together in the same way, using the same clues. So you've got the fundamentals of measuring and identifying a footprint or track. You've got um, other sign that you're looking for. And you've got your interpretation of the story to tell. So however you want to tell it, you're still using the same fundamentals, the same signs to put it together. So in summary, I'll use a prairie dog as summary. If you know me, obviously, um, as you know, I studied prairie dogs and there's no way I wouldn't find a way to include prairie dogs in any talk that I give. So briefly, I'll mention the prairie dog because they're actually the perfect species to practice all of these um, all of these elements with because they're very conspicuous. So they're easy to find, they're easy to watch, and there's clear evidence of them inhabiting a certain spot. And you can find their tracks, you can find other sign of them, and you can find the actual prairie dog itself. So we talked a bit about anatomy and gait, and you can see here the foot of the prairie dog and how well it matches the print that you see in the snow here. It is a plantigrade foot. So you see all the way from the toe back to the heel, I love these feet, of course. Um, and then you see this page from a track ID book. You can see how well it matches the stamp here. And also you see the, the track and the track will give you a W shape, like I've explained before with the squirrels hopping and prairie dogs are a type of squirrel and they do hop. So they have that characteristic W shape um, in their hop. And of course you can use ecology and other sign as we've discussed. You, you'll find prairie dog holes all over. They just spangle the prairie wherever prairie dogs live. Um, and you'll see these burrows all around. And although other animals live in the burrow, you can also look for scat. Um, if you find some prairie dog scat, it'll be homogenous spheres. And it, that'll definitely tell you that a prairie dog lives in that burrow. And they're about six inches in diameter, the, the hole, the mouth of the burrows. So you finally made your identification by putting all the clues in together. You've got yourself a prairie dog and it's so convenient to have everything in a nice spot. You've got their tracks, you've got their burrows, you've got the prairie dogs themselves. So there's no mystery. There's no guessing because likely while you're doing all this investigating, the prairie dog is standing just a couple feet away, barking its head off at you. So they're a really good species for practicing all of these elements of identifying a track and interpreting a story. You can go up to the VCMP and visit them there at the uh, entrance station, and you can really just practice watching for tracks, looking for other signs that they're around, looking for scat and things like that. Never deprive yourself of an opportunity to spend time with the prairie dogs. Um, but with that, uh, thank you so much. I have a couple of recommended guides that I like to use, my favorites here. Uh, a couple of them are available on Kindle, which makes it nice because you can carry it around with you um, while you're on the trail, or you can just carry a book with you, put it in a backpack or a fanny pack, and it makes it um, nice to have these guides with you um, so you can more quickly identify a track. Pass it on to Kristen for a moment here. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for um, for being patient and letting Mariana catch her stride again. Um, very good job. I would have been panicking so bad. You did it excellently. Um, <laughs> If anybody has any questions, now is the time to ask them. 
Suggest, ooh, this is a good question. Suggestions on taking photos in the snow. Oh, great, yes. So for this, for snow photos, um, first, firstly, I would suggest putting some shade over, over the track because otherwise it's just gonna be so overexposed and it's gonna be difficult. Um, to tell what it was if you're taking it home to refer to a guidebook later. Um, so I would definitely suggest um, putting it in some shade. And yeah, that's really, snow is so, it's it's actually quite easy to photograph tracks in snows. They come out pretty well. So it's just like mainly getting it, making sure there's uh, shade or for like composition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is coyote scat gray and white? Good question. Uh, yeah, so coyote scat is gray and white when it gets older. So if it's fresher scat, it will sometimes look white because of fur that may be in it. There'll be a lot of fur if it's just eating an animal. So it will sometimes look white. Um, the image I had, it was actually of uh, some older scat. So it just kind of dried up. I, I heard that um, it was white because of calcium deposits. Is that fair? Mm, I, yeah, that might be fair. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I took uh, in in school back in the day. That's back what the a day. Uh, teacher told me, but I yeah. am not sure if that professor. No, was that's right. really neat. And it actually makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, where does, again, another thank you for the presentation. Remember, y'all, it's recorded if you need a reminder on this. Um, where does the ringtail cat fall in types and tracks? Ooh, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So the ringtail is related to the raccoon. So if you see a raccoon track, um, they kind of, they're pretty cool. I don't have an image of one, but they look like little hands, um, which is basically what they are. They're very agile. They have very prehensile hands and they have very agile hands. Um, but yeah, the ringtail is uh, in the Procyonids, which are the raccoons. And so their tracks look a lot like a raccoon's. Um, and would you consider them a waddler or are they just a strider? They, they're waddlers, waddlers. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, does coyote scat also break down like bear scat did? It can. So it depends on what the coyote has eaten. Um, so if it has plenty of plant material, especially if it has plenty of plant material in it, um, as I mentioned, they do have simple digestive systems, so it doesn't get processed as much. So often if they leave it in, they can leave it in a pile that breaks up, that breaks down and you can use a stick to kind of dig into it and see what's in there. Perfect. Okay. So we have two questions about mountain lion tracks, which is very relevant to the area. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, so one person is asking, can we see an example? I don't know if you have one readily available. Um, maybe with the tail trailing, is that how they can be identified? And then another person was like, bobcat versus mountain lion. Mm -hmm. So I don't have one readily available, but I can go back to, I don't know if you can still see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, but I can go back to the bobcat example here and a mountain lion track will look exactly like this, but of course be much larger. And I don't have the exact measurements for you right now, but it will look like this. As far as, I wish I did have an image for you, um, but as far as a trailing tail, you won't typically see that because they don't really drag their tails. Um, so you probably won't see a trailing tail unless it was like a very lazy, tired mountain lion that didn't want to hold its tail up. <laughs> but um, they don't typically drag their tails, so you won't see that. Um, but they are much larger and they have a much longer stride, of course, uh, than bobcats do. And it's hard to mistake a mountain lion track for anything else. It's It, it sounds trite to say, but if you've seen it, you know it um, when you see one just by the sheer size of it. Yeah, this is just from the peak website reference. It's saying that um, it's like 3.3 inches by four inches. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty, big. That's big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's a big big footprint um do weasels tend to move around a lot in the same area and they have like a a little aside once i have seen super small digigrade tracks looks like a cat but much smaller it always looks like there's a whole herd of animals making tracks <laughs> and they've seen that's cool 
That's cool and really cute too. Yeah, so weasels do hold territories and because they are constantly on the hunt, they are constantly on the hunt and constantly um, catching scents and sights. Um, they do move around a lot. They cover a lot of ground in a single day um, in one contained area, just looking for food. So I, I I think you probably have found weasel tracks and that's really cool because it's not common. That's super, super cool. Yeah. Um. Okay, Ben is asking, is it easy to be fooled in identification by size when the track is a juvenile of a larger species? Yes. So that's a good question. Yes, it is. It is easy to be fooled. And there's that's basically as good as it <laughs> as it good as it gets is you kind of have to take a guess. If so, for example, if you're looking at a coyote versus a fox, if it's a really tiny coyote, if it's just a baby, for example, um, it'll look exactly like a fox track. And so you can you can use sometimes other clues um, to make a definitive ID, but in terms of size, they'll look exactly alike. Um, so it's really hard to tell the difference depending on whether it's a juvenile or an adult. That is true. Awesome. Thank you for that clarification, Ben. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll just give everyone a second more in case there's another question that pops up. Um, but while that's happening, I'm just going to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. Again, I've been very excited to have this talk for like a year. So I'm, I'm glad it finally happened. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much, Mariana, for joining us. I know Mariana is actually moving. So um, we'll miss you and your yeah, expertise. Okay. Hopefully um, you'll come back and visit us and maybe we can talk you into giving another presentation. <laughs> oh, sure, absolutely. Thank you everybody for being here and for being patient with me as well through the technical difficulties. No, you did fantastic. Um, a real pro. Um, and again, this is a recorded talk. We will have it on our YouTube. Mm, probably we're a little backlog. So probably within the next three weeks and you can reference it, send it to your friends that are like, how do I tell the difference between a coyote and a bobcat. <laughs> yeah. So um, that being said, thank you everyone. And, and I hope you have a great and awesome evening. Yeah. Thank you.